pray together. Uh, Father God, as we look at the words of Jesus today in the Gospel of John, I pray, what I pray every week, that uh, I would simply disappear and that your Holy Spirit would remain. And I ask that we would have ears to hear what it is that you have to say to us, and that we would be receptive to the voice of your Holy Spirit, every one of us, uh, as we listen to what Jesus has to say. So we pray all these things in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Uh, This summer, or this May actually, is pretty momentous for me and for my wife Olivia. Hey boo, see ya. Uh, Sorry, I don't know. Just (laughs) buckle up, I'm talking about you a lot. So uh, she is fine with this, by the way. Um, So in May, we celebrate our fifth wedding anniversary, which is great. So five years, if you need any advice, we're basically pros at this point. I'm just... (laughs) totally joking. We are obviously brand new at this. We've still got a whole lot to figure out, but uh, five years is kind of a, I don't know, it's a momentous time. It's, it's a good opportunity for us to look back and think about what God's been doing in our marriage and our relationship over the last five years. Uh, and we've learned a lot. I, I, I think one of the coolest things that I've experienced, uh, something I see happening, is the way that our lives have kind of been uh, more and more knitted together every year. It, it, it's this beautiful thing, every passing year. I mean, obviously, we're, we're developing inside jokes. And we've got countless inside jokes. We, we are learning how to be good roommates and respectful with each other's space and all that. I, uh, even learning how to avoid doing the pet peeves of each other. I just learned the other day that... That sound, you hate that sound, so I'm not going to make that sound anymore if I can help it. I'm going to do my very best. Just learned that like two days ago. So um, I've probably done it countless times, and I apologize, and I repent in dust and ashes. But uh, more than that, more than just the, uh, more than just the you know, growing in our friendship, um, I'm seeing how we are discovering a shared purpose as a couple. Like, our, uh, there's a reason that we are together that goes beyond our individual uh, purpose. We, we're developing shared passions, shared convictions. Uh, you may know we, we both love animals, we both love caring for creation, and uh, it, it started with one adopted rescue bunny, Humphrey, and now it's turned into dozens of creatures and uh, foster animals and adopted animals and pot pigs and chickens and dogs and, and uh, yeah, all of it. Lots of rabbits everywhere. And uh, we grow tons of stuff too. We've got fruits and vegetables just popping up everywhere. We've got our own little mini Eden in our, in our home. And that is something that we both are, are passionate about. We share in that mission. And even when we face challenges, like just this past month, we lost two of our hens, which was actually really, really sad for us, really devastating. Uh, even we just took in a new foster puppy who was really sick yesterday. And so that's a challenge. Even when we face challenges in that mission, What it seems to do is it keeps just doubling down our resolve uh, to make that something that we care about as a couple, what we're here to do. Again, I know it's only been five years. Some of you guys have been married for 40 and you're looking at me like, oh kid, you don't even know. I'm sure, I'm sure. We've only been here together for five years, but I'm learning what it means in these five years to share another person's joy. I'm learning how to, how to share another person's sorrow, how to, how to, what it means for two lives to become one. It's making sense to me now. It's an experience of mutual love, shared, interwoven love. Now, I say all this, and I know, I, I apologize, actually, because I know there are some of you, uh, this is not your experience of marriage, or maybe you're, maybe you're single, and, and you wish you were married, but you're not. I was single till I was 34, and I got really annoyed when other people talked about all their happy marriages and all that, so I apologize if that's you. I bring this up, though, because maybe you've had a different kind of relationship that's felt like this, this mutual love. Maybe it's a friendship you've had with a sibling or a parent or or just a longstanding friend or a grandparent maybe, where where you've experienced what it's like to have your life woven together with the life of another, where you've experienced that that mutual love, sharing another person's joys and sorrows uh, as you grow deeper. Not only is this, I think, part of what it means to be human, But I would argue, and I believe, that this kind of of interwoven love, this interwoven friendship and relationship, is what we are meant to develop and discover with Jesus. I really believe that. Not just a a divine being and a a, a puny mortal, not just a sinner and a savior, but, but two individuals being interwoven to become one, you and Jesus. Sharing joy, sharing sorrow, sharing passions, 
sharing purpose. I believe we are invited to experience mutual love with Jesus. And that's what we're going to talk about today. But I didn't just make that up. I didn't just uh, come up with that as as some sort of feel-good slogan. This is something that Jesus himself teaches in the Gospel of John. So let's take a look. Go ahead and turn with me to John 15. In the, if you want to look in the house Bibles in the seat in front of you, it'll be page 897. And while you're turning there, I'll give you just an unrelated, uh, unrelated update about something coming up. Last year, we had Hope Month all about uh, healing the broken place of decay. We talked about creation care. And, and when we did that, one of the things that it launched was a group of volunteers who are very passionate about creation care called Project Eden. And uh, Project Eden has been working to help Grace partner with some other churches to put on a really cool, unique event on April 23rd. It's called Indie Creation Fest, and it is going to be over at Christ's Community Church on Allisonville. I love that other churches are doing this together, but it is going to be a, uh, a, a festival, three hours or four hours of different uh, exhibitors and, and booths. We're going to have, uh, there's animal rescue organizations there. I think there are going to be adoptable puppies, kittens, uh, rabbits, and potbelly pigs actually present at Christ Community Church. So it's going to be really cool. There's, there's food trucks, there's all kinds of things, there's some teaching, and it's all about about what does it mean for us as the church to participate with God in caring for creation, for his creation. So it's going to be cool. Uh, Just thought you should know that that is on the way. All right, so let's look at John 15 and get back to this idea of mutual love. Um, Quick little bit of context. What we are going to read is, is part of the Last Supper, as it's often called. The Last Supper, where Jesus is about to go to the cross the following day, and uh, he, at this Last Supper with his disciples, is essentially telling them what's most important to him. That what's at the very core of his being, what, what is the thing that he, he desperately wants them to know before he goes to the cross. And uh, we saw, saw last week that he begins the Last Supper by doing something shocking. He lowers himself, he takes on the position of a servant, and he washes the feet of his disciples. And he says, I want you to do this for one another. And that's what we talked about last week. Well, he continues his teaching like this. John 15, verse 1. He says, I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Okay, we'll stop there. I'm the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. Now, Jesus talks a lot in big uh, parables and metaphors and images. This is nothing, nothing new for him. Uh, but this particular metaphor, this particular image, is actually one that he didn't make up. He's connecting to something that's, that's actually got a lot of history in the minds of the people of Israel. So I want to take just a second and give you a bit of context, the world of the text, about how what Jesus is talking about here connects to the broader images and metaphors that, that the Israelites understood. So Grapevines were a very significant image for the Israelites. They, they, all throughout the Bible, we see this ongoing metaphor of the people of God being a grapevine or a vineyard, okay? Uh, this was a big deal to Israel. The temple had grapevines carved onto the pillars. The, um, the coins in Israel had grapevines on them because this was an image that meant a lot. The people of Israel saw themselves as the vineyard of God. Okay, just, that's just what they, what they saw. Which is why when things about five, six hundred years before Jesus, when things in Israel were really going off a cliff, things were, the, the Israelites were really, really missing the point of what God wanted from them. They were really messing up. The prophet Isaiah, he used this vineyard metaphor to speak truth to them in a way that was kind of, kind of in their face. Listen to this. This is what he said in Isaiah 5. Now I will sing for the one I love, a song about his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a rich and fertile hill. He plowed the land, cleared its stones, and planted it with the best vines. In the middle, he built a watchtower and carved a wine press in the nearby rocks. Then he waited for a harvest of sweet grapes, but the grapes that grew were bitter. 
The nation of Israel is the vineyard of the Lord of heaven's armies. The people of Judah are his pleasant garden. He expected a crop of justice, but instead he found oppression. He expected to find righteousness, but instead he heard cries of violence. In other words, God created Israel to bear the sweet fruit of his intentions in the world, right? Justice, righteousness, life, peace, abundance. That's why Israel was chosen. That's why Israel was here. But instead, what did the people do? They spread injustice and evil and violence and pain, abuse. The the vineyard of God was producing bitter grapes, bitter grapes. Now, Isaiah, I mean, this seems to be the, the first time that one of the prophets really takes this image to this place, but it's not the only time. In fact, we see it, we see it echoed throughout the Psalms. Uh, Ezekiel, crazy Ezekiel, not crazy. He's kind of crazy. He's a little intense, but he has this whole long thing about vines growing in the forest where they don't get any sun, and so all the vines get cut off and thrown in the fire because they're useless. It's a whole thing. It, it, this image comes up again and again. And then we come to Jesus, And Jesus also uses this image. He speaks directly into this prophetic tradition. But look what he says. He says, yes, the Father is the gardener, just like in Isaiah 5, but Jesus calls himself the true grapevine, the true vine. Now, that word true in Greek, it means genuine. It means real, the the real deal. He's saying, yes, yes, the vineyard of God has produced an awful lot of bitter fruit. But I am the true vine, the genuine vine. I grow the way that God intended. And you, my followers, you're my branches. The fruit that you produce through me is sweet. It's the fruit that God desires. Okay, so you follow how he's using this this Old Testament metaphor in in, in his own time. But listen to this. This is what's important. He says this in verse 4. Our fruitfulness, bearing that sweet fruit, it depends on one thing. It depends on us remaining in him. Remaining in him. A branch that is severed from the vine is not going to bear fruit, bitter or sweet. It's just not going to happen. This probably goes without saying, but let's just camp here for just a second. What's the point of a grapevine? Why do you grow a grapevine, anybody? Grapes. Yeah, I mean, maybe like shade if you like really strategically place it over like a, some sort of pergola or something. Pergola. I don't think I've ever used that word in a sermon. So maybe shade, but no, it's grapes. You grow grapevines for grapes. I just planted my first grapevine a few weeks ago. I'm, I'm excited in like six years or something to have a grape from my grapevine because that's why you grow grapevines. Well, according to, to Jesus, if you cut a branch off a grapevine, right, right? That branch can't do the thing it was designed to do. Uh, The purpose of a branch on a grapevine is not to just exist. The purpose of a branch is to bear fruit, okay? Again, that's, that's obvious. The point of a branch, of a grapevine branch, is to bear fruit. And according to Jesus, the same thing is true of us. Our purpose is not just to be. Our purpose is not to just exist. We're here to be fruitful, the fruit of God's intentions for the world. That should be showing up in our lives. That's why we're here. But for that to happen, for that to happen, we must remain in him, Jesus says. We must be connected to the true vine so that our fruit is sweet. Because otherwise, what? We're worthless. Our lives don't have the the result that they were designed to have. So we got to remain. What does that mean? What does it mean to remain in Jesus? Well, let's, let's keep reading and we'll talk about it. Look at verse 5. Jesus goes on, he says, Yes, I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned, right? Echoes of Ezekiel there. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, You may ask for anything you want, and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. All right, so there it is again. Those who remain in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. So let's talk about this word remain. In Greek, it's the word meno. 
menno, and it's used a ton because it means a lot of different things, but essentially it means to, to abide somewhere or to remain in a place or to dwell or to stay. It could mean any one of those things. In terms of location, it'd be like saying, um, I'm gonna be staying, remaining in a certain town for a while, or, or I am living with my extended family, right? It describes the, the, the act of, of living in a certain place, of dwelling there. In terms of a relationship, it's pretty similar. It's like saying, uh, I'm gonna be with this person, we're gonna keep things the way that they are. We're not gonna change a thing, keep on keeping on. That's what it means to stay, to stick with a person. But here, Jesus is doing something kind of interesting. The verb form that he uses for this word meno, it's not passive. He's not saying, hey, look, if you, if you feel like it, why don't you stick around for a little while? You know, if you're up for it. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, it, it, he's making it clear that it is active, that, that remaining in him, it's an act of the will. To remain in Christ is something that we choose to do. Continuously, it's something that we, we give ourselves over to. We remain, we abide, we dwell with him. But notice this. This is so important. This is that the key of all of this. Even as Jesus is calling his followers to this active abiding in him, this choice to abide, to dwell, he makes it clear that it goes both ways. I mean, he says it again over and over again. Verse four, verse five, verse seven. If we remain in him, guess what? He remains in us, right? We dwell, we, we abide in him, and he dwells and abides in us. It's what you might call uh, a mutual indwelling, a mutual indwelling. He dwells, we dwell. It's this mutual indwelling. It's an active choice on our part, but it's met by an active choice on his. You see how that works? It's, it's two people having an active choice to dwell together. I spoke about my marriage a moment ago, right? It's the same concept at work there. We are growing together in mutual love. If you see a marriage where only one of the two parties is, is moving towards the other or growing or growing in love or putting in the work, if it's only one person, well, it's gonna be a real uphill battle for that marriage to survive or to thrive, right? Because it can't just be one person. Healthy marriages, in fact, all healthy relationships, they require both parties to be invested, abiding in one another, dwelling together, growing in trust, developing mutual love, mutual indwelling. That is, is how genuine relationships work. That's what Jesus is saying here. He's going to remain in us. That's a promise. That is done. He's already made that choice. The question is, are we going to choose to remain in him? Or are we expecting him to do all the heavy lifting in the relationship? Will we dwell in him as he dwells in us? And to get back to our, our operating metaphor here, are we going to be able to bear fruit because we are connected, we are dwelling with the true vine? And remember, this fruit that we're talking about here, this is not just, I don't know, some, some spiritual mysticism. This is the purpose of our life. It's the reason we are here. Like branches, we are not here just to exist, just to be. We're not here just to wander through our days alone and miserable and lost. No, we are here to bear the sweet fruit of God's intentions, of living in mutual love with the Son of God. Branches connected to the true vine. So that's what Jesus is teaching, but how? How are we supposed to do this? How do we remain in him? And, and what is this fruit specifically going to look like in our lives? Well, let's, let's read a few more verses and, and see if we can answer those questions. Jesus says, I have loved you, verse 9, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain, dwell, abide in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I've told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way that I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Self-giving love. Setting ourselves aside. That's what he's talking about here. So let's answer that first question. How do we remain in Jesus? 
Well, he, he tells us the answer in verse 10. He says, when you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. It's as simple as that. But what does he command? Well, look at verse 12. He spells it out. He says, this is my commandment. Love each other in the same way, in the same manner that I have loved you. Well, this is exactly what we talked about last week, isn't it? When Jesus washed his disciples' feet, Jesus took the position of a servant. He lifted them up whether they deserved it or not. Many of them didn't. He washed Judas' feet. Remember that? He took the position of a servant, and then he told them this. Since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. It is absolutely true that when Jesus says there's no greater love than this than to lay down one's life for, for, the, for one's friends, obviously he's talking about the cross, but he's also talking about washing his disciples' feet. He laid down his life. He put his dignity and his, his status aside for them. That's what his love looks like. Again, self-giving love. It is selflessness, setting ourselves aside. This is what Jesus expects of his followers. This is his commandment to us to love the way that he loves. That, that is how we remain and abide and dwell with him. And it's how he remains and abides and dwells with us when we do what he does. We live like he lives. We see the world through his eyes. We see other people the way he sees them. We love the world with his heart. We serve the world with his hands. That's when we are experiencing mutual indwelling, mutual love with our Savior. That's when we are grafted into the true vine. And guess what starts to happen when that happens? We bear fruit. We're grafted into the vine. And, and, and so our lives begin to fulfill the very purpose for which we were born, our destiny, not just to exist again, but to bear the sweet fruit of God's intentions for the world, justice and righteousness and peace and love and mercy and hope. That's what we begin to experience, not just in us, not just in our hearts, but through us into our broken world, right? Healing the brokenness around us. That's what we start to experience when we are dwelling with Christ. The fruit we bear is not just for us, it's for our broken world. And as a result, that's when we are filled with joy. Look, look at verse, verse 11. He says, yes, your joy will overflow. Not just be full, it'll overflow. Your joy will, will spill over into the lives of others. Why? Because it is not our joy. It's his joy. He says, you'll be filled with my joy. This is, is mutual joy. This is joy as, as, as we start to see the world that he created being healed, being able to, to look the way that he intended through the fruit of our lives. He created the world. He had intentions for the world, and we get to start living those intentions out. That is mutual love. Our God, God the Father, he's the gardener. He's the gardener. He's plowed the land carefully. He's cleared the stones. He's built a watchtower. Jesus Christ is the true vine that the Father planted in this fertile ground. And you and I are his branches. And we get to bear the fruit, his fruit, as we dwell together in love. It's a beautiful image, isn't it? I find that just so, it's beautiful, it's powerful, it's a little mystical. It's obviously something that, that we could probably spend a long time discussing and chewing on, this idea of, of being grafted into Jesus himself. It's powerful, but I want to I talk for a moment about what do we do with this? Like today, how do we, how do we take this, this powerful metaphor, this powerful image, and actually live it out? Well, I've got two reflections that I want to share based on this. One of them is for us as a church, and one of them is for you as an individual. So let's talk about us. Uh, first, if you look back at verse 7, uh, there's something in here that maybe you thought maybe I was going to skip right over. Uh, it's pretty crazy. He says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. Whoa, you saw that? You might have been like, well, that seems kind of like a lot. Is that, is that actually true? Like, wish for anything you want. Uh, 
I wish for a million dollars. Hey, that sounds, no, no, I wish for more wishes. Because right now, all of a sudden we're treating him like a genie, right? Is that what he means? Rub my lamp and then we're, no, that's not what he's getting at. Okay, that's not what he's talking about here. First of all, let me try to explain this. It, it, it doesn't show up in English, and so we often miss it. And I wish we had, I just wish we had this plural pronoun. But, but you, in most of this passage, is not individual, it's plural. He's saying you all, you all, whenever he says you here, for the most part, for the most part. If you all remain in me, if you all, you all may ask. So what he's describing here is not just some individuals making wishes, like I wish for, I wish for a a Maserati, I wish, uh, more accurately, I wish for a tractor would probably be more accurate for what I, that would be so nice, so nice, Uh, I don't have one, so. I wish for whatever. That's not what he's talking about. It's not me individually wishing for something. What he's saying is it's, it's the collective desire of his followers, right? What are the wishes of a community? What do we desire as the community of disciples, as the church? Because when the community of faith abides in him, when his, his words, Jesus' teachings, his commands, when they remain in us, abide in us, well then... We can ask for anything we want, and it will be granted. Here's how this works. Think about what what Jesus just said. He talked about mutual indwelling, right? Mutual love, growing together into kind of one person. Again, last time, sorry, Liv, I'm going to mention it one more time. As Olivia and I have grown in our marriage, you know what started to happen is we've started to desire the things that the other person desires. This is natural, but, but we long for the other person's happiness, we're overjoyed by each other's joy. We share one another's sorrows. That, that's mutual love. We're becoming one in that. That's, we're growing in that. We've got a lot farther to go, but that's how that works. Now imagine if that exact same thing was true between Jesus and the church, or, or between Jesus and Grace Church, okay? Imagine if that was true. Imagine if we are a community that is abiding together in Christ, if we are, we are loving the way he loves, if we're being nourished by the true vine, and if, as he promises, if he is at the same time abiding in us, dwelling with us, well then guess what starts to take place? We, as a community, our desires will start to change, won't they? If we're, if Jesus is abiding in us and we are abiding in him, you know what we don't want? We don't want nicer buildings and flashier worship and more money and fame. That's not even on our radar. What we want are transformed lives. We want, we want healed relationships. We want a community that makes room for everybody. That's what we want. We want to see truth and grace and justice in our world. That's what we desire. You know what that means? We want what he wants. That's what happens when we remain as a community grafted into the true vine, then of course he is going to give us what we ask for because it is exactly what he desires too. Our church becomes interwoven with Christ and we become one. So Grace Church, Grace, let's learn what it means to abide in Christ as a community. Let's learn the way of self-giving love that he taught us. Let's wash each other's feet like he told us to do. Let's learn how to want what he wants so that we can bear the fruit of his intentions for this world. So that's the challenge to us as a community. But what about us as individuals? What about you? where you are in your life. All this talk of abiding in Jesus and and mutual love, it is a communal thing, but it's not just a communal thing. In fact, it's actually an intensely personal and individual thing as well. I mentioned before that the word abide, it's active, right? It's intentional. It's an act of the will. And each one of us has to make that choice. We have to act on it. So let me ask you this. How are you doing at abiding in Christ these days? I don't mean this in like a a shameful way. I'm just genuinely asking. As you reflect on where you are, are you sharing in mutual love with Jesus? Are you seeing the sweet fruit of his intentions for the world coming to fruition in your life? Are you seeing that? Look, it is so easy. I talk about this all the time. It is so easy for us to treat following Jesus as some sort of 
to-do list of beliefs that you check off, you check the right things, and, and, and you got it all squared away, right? Or we treat it like, like it's a moralistic religion where, you know, you do all the right things or else you're going to get blasted. It's easy to think of following Jesus as a status. Well, I'm a Christian. I'm a, I don't know, evangelical. I go to church or whatever, right? Think of it as a status. But following Jesus, it's really none of those things. Following Jesus is a relationship, It's a relationship with a real person. Jesus is a real person with emotions and dreams and passions of his own. He's a real person who wants to speak with you and to weep with you and to rejoice with you. Just like a lifelong friendship or marriage, it is a relationship that grows and he desires to grow deeper. Truly following Jesus means having your life interwoven with his, growing together in mutual love till you become indistinguishable as a pair. And here's what I want you to hear. Wherever you are on your faith journey, whether you've been walking with Jesus for decades or whether you're not even sure if he exists, wherever you are on your faith journey, I want you to hear something loud and clear today. Jesus wants to dwell more deeply with you. He wants to dwell more deeply with you, whether you are a a, a Christian for 50 years, you're not even sure whether you believe it. He wants to dwell more deeply with you. Just as he says in verse nine, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. I've loved you, it's done, it's true, it's over. Will you remain though in my love? Again, wherever you are on your journey, I want you to know that Jesus is ready and willing and waiting to go deeper. Do you believe that? Speak to him. Tell him what you fear. Tell him what you love. Tell him what you're dreaming of. He's a real person. He wants to grow deeper with you. And listen. Listen. Listen for his voice. Listen for his correction, perhaps. Listen for who he says you are. Have you heard yet the voice of Jesus telling you who he sees you to be in this world? The fruit that he wants you to bear. Listen, and I think he'll tell you. Abide in Christ, and he will abide in you. Dwell with Christ. He will dwell with you. You are more than just a useless branch. You are more than just a a stick lying on the ground. No, you are part of the vine of God's vineyard. And he has designed you to bear his fruit. Dwell with Jesus. Abide with him. Remain connected grafted into the true vine. And I tell you what, you're going to bear some fruit that will change this world. Let's pray. Well, Father, I know that for many of us, it is, uh, sometimes it can be kind of hard to hear things in metaphorical language and images and, and uh, word pictures. I know sometimes we just want that to-do list. We want the checklist. But Father, relationships aren't checklists. And if you are really truly calling us into a relationship with your son, Jesus, to be, to be growing together in mutual love and interwoven love, then, then Father, I pray we would begin to, um, to step into the mystery of that image. I pray, Father, that we would begin uh, to trust if we haven't already, that your son does desire, that Jesus wants to grow deeper in love with us. And I pray, Father, for wherever we are on our faith journey, that right now, this week, this month, this year, we would make an active choice to dwell and abide more deeply in you, trusting and knowing that you will be doing the same to us. So Father, walk with us, speak to us, and give us ears to hear your voice. We pray this in the name of Jesus, the true vine. Amen. 
Thanks for watching, but don't stop there. We want you to find community at Grace Church, and the first step in doing that is going to gracechurch.us slash hub. There you'll find other sermons, details about upcoming events, and other important announcements. And make sure you subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out when we post something new. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time.